We have a correction of sorts to make tonight. It was believed both by us and by guests who have appeared on the show, and frankly by lots of other people, that the survey the Pentagon is doing right now to determine how members of the military feel about the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was an unprecedented thing. We and others believed that when the military had gone through other forms of desegregation, either by gender or by race, that they didn't conduct this kind of a survey, that prior moves to desegregate the military were top-down decisions that were just made without asking the average infantryman what he thought about the policy change. Turns out that's not true. Earlier this week, a Pentagon spokesperson told The Advocate magazine that Defense Department historians had found evidence that the military did, in fact, conduct surveys about racial integration in the military prior to changing the policy in the 40s. Armed with that clue, the folks at Think Progress deserve big props for actually trooping down to the National Archives and digging up some of the surveys that the military conducted around racial integration in the 1940s, ahead of President Truman's 1948 order to desegregate. Remember, the basic history here is that in 1948, after generations of African Americans had served in separate all-black units in the U.S. military, President Truman, as commander-in-chief, made the decision to end legal racial discrimination in the military. Now, remember, this was 1948, six years before the landmark Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education, mandating that schools be integrated, seven years before the Montgomery bus boycott, 15 years before Martin Luther King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech, 16 years before the Civil Rights Act passed. Interracial marriage was illegal in more than two dozen states in 1948. In other words, ending racial segregation in the military was a very big deal in 1948. But the military did ask the troops what they thought about the issue beforehand. And the results were, I mean, on the one hand, astonishing, and on the other hand, weirdly, totally what you'd expect. Here's what I mean. Um, a 1942, no, a November 1942 survey of white enlisted men's feelings about African Americans in the Air Force found that, quote, an overwhelming majority of the men feel that Negro and white soldiers should be separated both during and after training. Check out the bar graph on this one. 82% of enlisted men thought African Americans should attain se attend separate training schools. 76% of them wanted them to be in separate combat crews. And 74% thought there should be separate all-black ground crews as well. Here's another survey from 1947, cleverly titled, Attitudes of Officers and Enlisted Men Toward Certain Minority Groups. And when they say certain minority groups, what they mean is Jews. It was a survey of how members of the armed forces felt about serving not just with black men, but, a, but with Jewish men. It turns out they were not thrilled about it. When presented with the statement, there is nothing good about Jews, 86% of the enlisted, enlisted men surveyed agreed. 86%. Also, who wrote this freaking survey anyway? Um, as for the question of racial integration, quote, four out of five white enlisted men are opposed to the idea of having Negro and white soldiers in the same units, even if they do not eat in the, sla in the same mess or sleep in the same barracks. You want to know how many officers and enlisted men thought black and white soldiers should work and train and live together? How many people were actually in favor of integration? A grand total of 7%. 7% of officers and enlisted men thought the military should be integrated. So given that, given that these were the views of the troops in 1947, what did President Truman do in the following year in 1948? He ordered that there be desegregation. He said to the military, essentially, deal with it. And they did. And frankly, that's the American way. We're not just a democracy, we're a constitutional democracy. There are rights that are guaranteed to us all by the Constitution. Those rights are not up for a vote. And the reason that's truly important, the reason it's not just a romantic, sepia-toned flashback to the founding of this country is because people always want to vote on rights. They always want to vote on minority rights. And whenever they do, whenever you put the rights of a minority up for a vote, it almost always fails. On gay rights, for example, the issue of gay marriage has been put to a vote in 31 states. And all 31 of those states have voted it down. But because this is America, rights are not supposed to be put to a vote. That's why they're called rights. That's why we have a constitution and why we struggle every day to prove that we still honor it. Opinions, surveys, polling, be darned. This is America, and the rights of man are inalienable, no matter what skeeves you out. And so now the Pentagon is surveying the troops on what they think about serving with openly gay people. The results may very well be as reactionary as what we saw in those surveys from the 1940s. And if we are still a constitutional republic, 
if the concept of inalienable, inalienable equal rights, inalienable equal rights still means something, the results of that survey will be interesting. They will also be completely irrelevant to the question of whether or not this policy should and will be changed. It started here on this show, um, and now it, it doesn't end here, but it does take a very sharp turn. 16 months ago, West Point graduate, Arab linguist, Iraq veteran, First Lieutenant Dan Choi made this very dramatic news right here on our air. I am an infantry platoon leader in the New York Army National Guard, and by saying three words to you today, I am gay, those three words are a violation of Title 10 of the U.S. Code. Today, nearly a year and a half after that announcement, Lieutenant Dan Choi has been fired from the U.S. military. Quote, based on the approved board findings that First Lieutenant Choi did publicly admit on more than one occasion in person and through the media that he is a homosexual, such conduct being in violation of 10 U.S. Code Section 654, subsection B2, I direct First Lieutenant Choi be discharged from the New York Army National Guard with an honorable characterization of service. Ironically, the name of the adjutant general signing off on Lieutenant Joy's discharge is Brigadier General Patrick Murphy. A coincidence, no relation to another Patrick Murphy, also an Iraq veteran, now a congressman, who has led the way in Washington for the repeal of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy, policy that has now claimed Dan Choi's career. Lieutenant Dan Choi joins us now. Dan, thank you very much for joining us. It's a real honor to have you back on the show. Great to be with you. I hope the audio doesn't cut out this time. Yeah, that could, did that very <laughs> dramatic first night. Uh, Dan, well, we this, can't blame the government because there's no conspiracy this time, right? right? There's no reason why they'd cut me off. At this point, yeah, at this point, you, at this point, you are a civilian. Uh, I mean, this must be a very hard day for you, Dan. How are you doing? It's the first time uh, I'm a civilian since I was 18 years old. It's, you know, as, as much as you can prepare for this kind of... Uh, consequence and I knew exactly what I was getting into when I appeared on your show the very first time uh, as much as you build up your armor and get ready for those words saying that you're fired you, you can't deal with that pain and the emotion I mean I, I think back on my entire time in the military from the days that I was at West Point to getting ready for deployment infantry training uh, and even the activism all of it comes up and and it's a big emotional roller coaster uh, and it's it's painful and it hurts and I I mean right now my career is over but I know that there are still hundreds of other people that are going to be fired and go through the same thing throughout this year when you look back on these 16 months after coming out all the activism you've engaged in getting arrested protesting this policy serving with your unit while being openly gay do you, do you feel regret do you wish you had stayed in the closet longer and waited for the policy to end Absolutely not. Being in the closet is a poison. It's a, it's a deadly, toxic disease that people don't even realize how difficult that is until they're finally out. There are a lot of times when I look back at my time in, in service and I told myself, well, why didn't I come out or why did I join? I mean, I knew I was gay. Uh, I didn't want to come out to my parents. My dad is a, is a minister. He's affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention. He didn't want to know that his son, who went to West Point and went to Iraq as an infantryman, is also gay. He just wouldn't know how to deal with that. There's so many people that have a don't ask, don't tell in their own hearts and in their own homes, and they deal with that same kind of enforced shame and that kind of enforced hatred of themselves, and it really tears away at the very fabric of who they are. Do you think, Dan, that your, your civil disobedience efforts, getting arrested over the course of the last year and a half, do you think that the, the, that activism contributed to you being discharged now? Do you think that was part of it? Well, it'd be very difficult for me to say that since the charges were dropped at the very last minute uh, by the federal government and by the D.C. government for whatever reason. Um, a lot of people have seen that actions not only in uh, achieving LGBT rights, gay and transgender rights uh, is effective, but it's been effective throughout our entire history. From the time of the Boston Tea Party throughout the American Revolution, we've seen military officers get on up and, and act up because they know that the meaning of service and the meaning of our country is not wrapped up in a sentiment or a, an emotion or a, an argument about what the uniform signifies, that uniform that I've put on, that uniform that I've worn since the very first days at West Point, 
That stands for fighting for freedom and justice. And if there is no fight for freedom and justice, then nobody deserves to wear that uniform. Dan, if the policy is repealed, and sources do say it could happen in the spring, in less than a year, do you think that you would sign up again? Do you know what's next for you? Well, I don't base a lot of my timelines, or I don't think anybody should base their actions on a political uh, guesstimate. I think that if we were to do that, then we wouldn't be where we're at today. Uh, but I know for sure that if the law is repealed and uh, President Obama finally takes action and we can go back, of course, in a heartbeat. There's nothing that I should be afraid of. I've been serving openly in my infantry unit, and there's been nothing but positive impact. There's no reason why anybody needs to be afraid. There's no need for a survey. There's no need for a poll. There's no need for people to put up shower curtains because they're afraid of what might happen. I've been serving for, for 17 months quite openly, and I've seen nothing but positive impact when you tell people around you, people who you work with, the truth about who you are. There's nothing but an increase in unit cohesion, in teamwork, in trust. Honesty is the fabric, the foundation of all of that. Lieutenant Dan Choi, I'm, I know you had a million choices of who to talk to on TV tonight, and I want to thank you for choosing to be with us here. And as always, thank you for your service. Rachel, we wouldn't be here with Don't Ask, Don't Tell if it wasn't for people like you who stick to the facts and tell them unashamedly. So I have you to thank, and I believe all of America owes you a debt of gratitude. Thank you very much. You're way too kind. Thanks, Dan. Good luck to you, man. Stay in touch, okay? I will.